To say that Boeing is in crisis would be putting it mildly. What was once a shining example of a great American manufacturer is now hunting for a new leader after CEO Dave Calhoun announced he's stepping down after a long line of safety failures. Most recently, a door plug flew off a Boeing 737 in January, creating a hole in the plane in midair, which prompted a series of investigations and inquiries that ID'd other loose parts, too. No one was seriously hurt, but the failure harkened back to two deadly 737 MAX crashes back in 2018 and 2019, Lion Air Flight 610 and Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302, which killed a total of 346 people. And the company's decline can be traced much further back than that. You know me from this show, but I'm also a business school professor who's been on the faculty of both Harvard and Yale. I've written two books on leadership, and I've been writing articles about Boeing for a decade. Because I think Boeing is one of the most important companies in America and the best example of what's gone wrong with our economy for the last 40-plus years. I'm joined now by Richard Abalafia, the Managing Director of Aerodynamic Advisory and Aerospace and Defense Management Consultancy, which has worked for Boeing and its competitors, and Javier de Luis, an aerodynamics lecturer at MIT who recently served on an FAA expert panel to review Boeing safety. Before we start, I should note, we reached out to Boeing to invite a representative to join us. They declined. Javier, let me start with you. What, what did you find when you were investigating Boeing's safety? Why are they, what are, why are they having so many problems? <laughs> that's, uh, our, our, our report has 50 recommendations, mm -hmm. so that's a lot to go through in the opening statement, but I will highlight maybe the one that's been getting the most uh, press or the most interest, which is that the panel found this disconnect that exists between the words that are being said by the executive suite, the high-level managers, and what is being observed and believed at the worker, at the factory floor, at the engineering design floor level. You know, they hear, yes, safety is our number one priority, and they say, yes, until we fall behind, and then it's push it out the door as fast as you can. They hear, oh, you won't be punished if you speak up, but they see their buddy who spoke up about a problem with safety, all of a sudden he's on the short end of the, of the raises uh, uh, when, when they're doling out raises or promotions. And we saw this time and time again across both the people that assemble the planes, the people that design the planes, uh, the people that are delegated by the FAA to do the testing and verification on behalf of the FAA. They all express different variations of this theme that, yes, the words are there, uh, but the actions are, are, do not match the words. So that was sort of like one of the big takeaway talking points that we found. So ignoring quality would be a problem for sort of, sort of any company, mm -hmm. but more for Boeing maybe than any other company. And, and you have a very personal connection with that. Uh, sadly, that, that's correct. Uh, my, my sister, Gachi, Graciela, uh, Gachi as we called her, was on board Ethiopian 302. And uh, which crashed uh, five years ago. It was almost exactly five years ago uh, in March. And um, since that time, I kind of started working with a group of families uh, who also lost loved ones on that, essentially trying to provide a little bit, I call it a little bit of impedance matching, you know, a little bit of trying to sit between the FAA and, and, and the acronym-filled world of aviation and the families. Since then, we've been joined by people that know a lot more than I do, so I've had, I've, I haven't had to continue that. Uh, but that was how I started it. And then... As a result of that, some of the work that we do is work with Congress, legislation, work with the media to try to make sure that the message gets out about what ha actually happened. And in that role, that's, I was named to be part of this expert panel that was mandated by the legislation that was passed four years ago, the AXA legislation that was passed four years ago, that attempted to change the way that the FAA val uh, certifies airplanes. And part of that was to form this panel of 20 so expert, 24 experts in various aspects of aviation to go and look at the Boeing safety culture, the way that Boeing implements their safety management system, et cetera, and things like that. And we spent a year doing that. So, Javier, Boeing's reputation, right, they famously, people would say, if, it, if it's not Boeing, I'm not going, and clearly that's not it anymore. Um, in fact, I, we, can, we have a, sh a shot of, in fact, you can, on kayak, you can use a filter that will actually allow you to avoid flying on Boeing aircraft, mm -hmm. which is just inconceivable, um, even a few years ago. I'm just, has anyone at Boeing expressed sort of remorse or regret to you over the series of decisions that led to the death of your sister and 345 other people? To me personally? Yeah. No. No. Okay. Um, I mean, they, there is a, 
Boeing, Boeing his message is very structured, as you know, uh, very lawyer, lawyerified, you know, if that, that's a word. They measure very, very carefully what they say. Um, I think that that is part of the problem, frankly. I mean, um, there, are, there are some excellent engineers at Boeing. There are some excellent machinists, mechanics, fantastic people. And they've really been let down by what Boeing has been transformed over the last 20 years. Richard, I mean, Boeing is an iconic company, if any American company is. It's, it's America's largest exporter. Um, I mean, in one of my articles, I said that the story of civil aviation is largely the story of Boeing. How, how did they go so wrong? What, what caused this? Yeah, I mean, boy, it's, it's tough to blame anything other than just bad management. And it's pretty clear that, you know, at first when McDonnell Douglas and Boeing merged back in the late 1990s, that there would be a much greater financial approach to things, a de-emphasis on engineering and new product development and everything the company had done so well with for its first, uh, you know, <laughs> 90 something years. Um, but the joke was, or the irony is, or the, the tragedy is that, uh, you know, McDonnell Douglas at the end of the day was a recognizable aerospace company with recognizable aerospace people. It got much worse when folks came over from the well, the Jack Welch GE days with their emphasis on ruthless cost cutting and a one size fits all to management uh, approach that was ill suited for aerospace. And so when CEO Jim, Jim McNerney came in in 2005, things got much worse. And probably the greatest mystery of the whole process is that somehow when Dave Calhoun uh, came in in 2019, he was able to present himself as a change agent even though he was cut from exactly, precisely the same background, the same cloth as McNerney. So it's, it's tough to blame anybody else uh, because, uh, as you say, you know, the talented Boeing is fantastic. The legacy is fantastic. Uh, the technologies are terrific. It really was management setting a very negative tone. So this is a remarkable story, right, because you have Boeing, an extraordinarily successful company, merged sort of shotgun wedded with McDonnell Douglas, a, a failing company, and, you know, the engineers who had made Boeing great and financial people who had destroyed McDonnell Douglas and somehow the people who were running the failing company ended up in charge, right? As, as you, you know, I think I learned from one of your articles, the line in the industry was that, that McDonnell Douglas bought Boeing with Boeing's money. And so I just like to push on this question a little bit. Why would the people who ran the company that had to be rescued end up in charge when the company that was actually doing the rescuing was there with its successful culture and successful practices? Yeah, good question. I mean, part of it came down to a series of scandals or mini scandals that marginalized a couple of key people and allowed others to rise. And somehow in the chaos of a series of these scandals that also affected the key McDonnell Douglas person, Harry Stonecipher, um, somehow they got the idea, maybe at the board level, of bringing an outsider. And at the time, there was this Wall Street cult of Jack Welch and General Electric, and that just seemed like the right idea. And, um, well, the folks from the GE side of the house said, wow, it's a revenue stream. Uh, <laughs> this, you know, in an industry with very high barriers to entry, um, we can have some fun with this. And they put in place uh, a, plan, a plan, it's hard to think of anything else other than a plan, to basically extract cash from it and deprioritize everything that had made Boeing great. Not to come up with a kind of grand conspiracy here, but it, it was probably irresistible to them. And, you know, the things that softened um, excesses at GE uh, perhaps the, you know, complicated nature of its structure, its horizontal conglomerate uh, status, whatever, just didn't apply to Boeing. It, <laughs> it, it was all too easy to go after, you know, the budget for new product development for engineers to make everything a cost center to be crunched, you know, labor to be negotiated with and crunched down on terms and costs. Um, and the consequences over time just got worse and worse. So there are some real financial numbers we can attach to this. Um, so SEC filings show that Boeing spent from 2013 to 2023 that they spent $573 million on executive pay, 
more than $40 billion on stock buybacks and more than $21 billion on dividends to shareholders. Richard mentioned that they crunched down their employees at the same time. We can make that by contrast. In 2014, Boeing signed a 10-year deal between their, bet between their Boeing and their union workers and the International Association of Machinists. Um, it extended their contract through 2024. It froze worker pensions. They switched to a 401k style plan. And over the 10 years... They gave their workers, the skilled machinists who actually made the planes, a 4% general wave, wage increase uh, plus the cost of living and a $10,000 signing bonus. I think their CEO did a little better than that. Just a tad. So, Javier, can you help our listeners understand why, this, you know, so Jack Welch, when I, teach, when I teach my students about Jack Welch, I say that he took the world's greatest industrial company and turned it into a hedge fund that happened to own some factories. Mm -hmm. That hasn't worked out all that well for GE either, but can you help our, our viewers understand why that's such a problem for Boeing in particular? Well, it, it's, it, I, I wish I could, but I can try. I mean, yes, Jack Welch, I mean, it's easy to make money if you eat your seed corn, you know? I mean, and that's basically what Boeing is, has been doing. But Boeing is, it's, the situation is much worse, in my opinion, than with GE, because there's no, Boeing is in, a, is in an industry where there is no alternative. Right. I mean, if you say, well, I'm going to just buy Airbus. Well, OK, go buy an Airbus today. You'll get it maybe in about six years because they just can't produce them. The, the lines are so backed up. So basically, no matter how bad things are, right, people are still are lining up to buy the airplane. Plus, it's also happens to be what the largest defense contractor, second largest defense contractor. So there's no way it's going to ever go under. So. You know, it, it's it, if I, if you're on, my pessimism as to what can ha what's going to happen is based on the fact that I'm not so sure there's any incentive to change at the board level, right? I mean, they're still they they, they look at this as a cash machine that's still going to be producing cash now, less so now because of all the problems. But I, I'm not so sure that there is any incentive to change uh, and start focusing on investing in your in in your in your factories and your people in your R&D in order to produce the next airplane. Didn't, didn't uh, Calhoun say a year ago that he was happy being number two to Airbus? Uh, he did. Uh, yeah. And he also said in, in November that, that they would not launch another air, new airplane I mean, Mr. Years. Boeing would be rolling, is rolling over in his grave, is doing somersaults in his grave to think that we're, give, we're fine being the sex that he also ran. And number two will easily change to being number three. If we're, you know, without, without waiting too long. So, I mean, many so a Boeing airplane is sort of the large, the, other than, a, other than a, a silicon chip, is the most complicated thing human beings manufacture. I think it's the way to think about it. Um, they have two million moving parts. Yes. It's and, the most complicated mass-produced item that human beings ever make. Ever. So I wonder if the two of you could help us understand, like, the cost cutting that you're talking about, the pace that you're talking about, how does that lead to errors on the factory floor as egregious as f the four, you know, bolts that hold a part of the plane on not being replaced? Well, the the, the bolts is a, I think is a well understood story exactly about what happened. Uh, you know, they they, they, they uh, a plane came, uh, a body of a plane came in from Spirit, a, a, a spinoff from Boeing that should never have happened. It came in. There was a problem with some some um, attachments, some fittings next to this door. They had to remove the door in order to fix that problem. When they put the door back, nobody put the bolts in. And, you know, how does that happen? Well, you know, people say, oh, it should have been inspected. Yes, it should have been inspected. Yes, there were, were there systems that failed. Yes, there were systems that failed. But here's the thing. How in the world was some, did somebody put that door in and not put the bolts on? How was that person not trained to do that? I don't, I, I cannot for the life of me, imagine how that can happen. I mean, maybe he was a machinist who left because there was only a 4% raise for 10 years. Or, or maybe it was somebody that came in and got eight hours worth of training and said, go put this door in, right? Now, you can, you can scratch deeper and you can say, why, why, were the, why was that door plug designed so that the bolts could come off in the first place? They were all, you can always keep on peeling the onion, right? But to me, you know, people say it should have been inspected. Well, you can't, I don't never believe that you can inspect your way to quality. I think you have to ha it has to be ingrained into everything that you do. And clearly, that that doesn't exist. At that, it didn't exist at that in, the, in that case. And I don't think that it exists. The Ryanair CEO today said, "Oh yeah, we find spanners all the time, in the plate, in the in the you know wrenches and stuff all the time in the planes that are delivered." I'm like, really? I can see that finding once, right? But after you find it once, don't you find out why it happened and make sure it never happened again? Oh no, it just keeps on happening. I don't, I don't get it. 
so, so Boeing is important as one of the world's two great airplane manufacturers, but it's sort of more important than that in a way that I think people don't commonly understand, that Boeing sort of pushes the technological frontier for American manufacturing forward and has spillover effects that benefit the whole American economy. Uh, Richard Javier, I'll, I'll, Richard, to start with you, could you sort of comment on that to help people understand why we're so focused on Boeing in particular here? Well, as the professor says, this is an industry with extremely high barriers to entry and there's not a lot of um, ability to, to choose uh, something other than an Airbus or a Boeing right now if you want to fly or if you're an airline who wants to fly people. Also, uh, yes, it is indeed the uh, second biggest defense contractor, I believe. And here again, the barriers to entry are enormous. So you've got the situation that for at least the next 10 years, we're stuck with them. You know, it would be terrific if somebody were to enter the commercial jetliner market. Um, and I, I have hope, but it's going to take a long time for that to pay off. And in the meantime, if you want to fly, um, and if you're an airline that wants to fly people, you know, that's that's your choice. You know, it, Airbus is doing its best to ramp up um, and meet demand. Uh, matter of fact, their stated goal is to get to uh, 75 narrow body jets per month. Well, Airbus, uh, you know, while Boeing is basically stuck somewhere in the 20s trying to get things in order. Um, but even there, you know, there are limits in how quickly Airbus can ramp up to meet demand. Um, and, and of course, the broader economic implications from an export standpoint, from a, an employment standpoint, from a national technology standpoint, are enormous too. It, 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 no matter, you know, there's no way to cut it. This is a national champion, and uh, there's no replacing it. Completely agree. I mean, it has to, you know, people say it's too big to fail. It's also too big to produce bad product. It has to be fixed. So it's, I mean, it's sort of striking to me because the one thing that Republicans and Democrats under, agree on in this country is that the United States needs to refocus on manufacturing. Mm -hmm. We need to get become a great manufacturing country again, both for employment reasons and for inequality reasons, but also for national defense reasons. And it's difficult for me to imagine a way that happens without Boeing. That, you know, titanium composites, systems integration, if you want to be the sophisticated manufacturing leader for the, you know, for the next 20 years, you kind of need to have a company like Boeing. Absolutely. Driving. Okay. Absolutely. And so given all that, you know, given the criticality of Boeing, not just to the industry, but to the whole U.S. economy, and what would, I mean, someone's going to have to take Dave Calhoun's seat, um, what would you what would you tell them Boeing needs to what, what would you Richard what would you tell tell him or her what that Boeing needs to do next? Ninety nine percent of life is just showing up. You know, frankly, that conversation we were having a moment ago about, you know, how errors get made. You know, let's posit two different examples of how to do a production ramp. In the old way of doing things, and one of the best parts of my job is walking on factory floors. And you know, the old way of doing things, if you were a top executive at Boeing or whether a large aerospace company, you should go and meet the people in charge of that production ramp. You'd say, what resources do you have? What do you need given that? Uh, and given what is in the pipeline, what do you think is a reasonable rate that we can get to? How can we do this? You'd work in cooperation and you'd understand the art of the possible. The alternative approach is to stay in an office building working on Excel spreadsheet models and say, we need X amount of cash to please our investors or whatever, or pay down debt or whatever else. Therefore, we need to build X number of jets. Hey, uh, guys, go make that happen. And that's exactly how, well, uh, you under-resource for a production ramp or make unreasonable expectations, which result in quality escapes and traveled work and all these other euphemisms. So basically, getting back to your question, what's needed is people who show up and talk to people who are engaged in the core business of designing and manufacturing airplanes. And don't forget that that office, that building that you mentioned, where they're looking at Excel spreadsheets, it's 3,000 miles away from your factory. So, because they moved their headquarters from Seattle to, well, now to Virginia. You know how, yeah. many, you know how many airplanes are manufactured in... In the Beltway? Well, it is striking. I think it was Stonecipher who moved them to Chicago. And um, was, was, it, it, was it Stonecipher? Was it Stonecipher? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Stonecipher. Yeah. And his explanation for why he did it was he said, this is a quote, I use it with students all the time, um, right, that I did not want to be distracted right. from my job by, by the details of building airplanes. 
And I always pose this question. Floored. What did he think Boeing did? Like, like I'm, I'm genuinely, I would love to meet him and ask him what he thought his job was if it wasn't building airplanes. You, you said uh, showing up, right? I completely agree. If, you know, whoever's in charge of the 37 and the and boy, every time they meet with their boss, whoever it happens to be after Calhoun, they should be asked, how, how many times were you on the factory floor and what did you learn? This past week, how many? What? How many times were you? Did you talk to the engineering design teams, and what did you learn? Because otherwise, it's clear that it, the disconnect. I hate to keep going back to that word, but the disconnect is just—it's going to kill them, and it's going to kill a lot of other people. And I should mention also, it's not just their own factory floor. Seventy percent or more of the value of a Boeing jet comes from suppliers. So, do they have the resources needed? Mm -hmm. Go and visit them. Talk to them, see what their requirements are. And you, they spent the last decade basically badly under-resourcing their supply chain, kind of like GEM did with uh, with its suppliers back in the 90s, thinking, well, what could the consequences be if we take away their margins, take away their aftermarket business, literally sweep up the scrap metal from their floors and claim it as our own? How could there possibly be any consequences? And of course, you know, good luck finding the working capital needed to make the production ramp. Good luck getting the people, whatever else. You know, they didn't understand that because they didn't show up. So I, you can kind of see how people, right, financial, financially trained people, people who's, you know, I'd say is the most complicated thing they've ever built is a financial model in Excel, who've never built, you know, bent, bent steel or welded titanium or sort of machine, gotten composites to glue together might think this was the right way to build a company. But now, sort of everyone in the industry says this. I have not read a single person who says that Boeing is not, you know, is, has not over-focused on finance. But it's sort of striking that the new CEO of Boeing Commercial, that who Boeing picked was Stephanie Pope, who, I mean, I've never met her, but she is by training an accountant, not an engineer. Javier, do you have a, like, a uh, thought? I've never met her. Yeah. She might be a perfectly fine person uh, based on the resume that I saw, uh, I'm sorry, but I, that is not the person that I'd be putting in in charge of building the most complex thing that human beings have ever mass produced. I mean, I, I have a lot of respect for accountants, I, especially around tax season. Uh, you know, and, and like I said, she's, she's clearly capable. She's been there for 30 years. But is that the I mean, I, I, just, I just don't see it. I'm sorry. Uh, and, and it's not to say that it, you need an engineering degree, okay? I mean, uh, but I just, I just don't think that that's the right person. The times call for a much different type of person, I believe. Richard? Yeah, I could not agree more. Of course, you know, the only hope I've got is that Stan Deal left the office the very day of the announcement. So maybe she was brought in as a kind of interim stabilization uh, measure. Um, but other than that, it doesn't get any more completely removed from the business of designing or building airplanes. And also... Don't forget, if you have a non-engineer at the top job in a uh, you know, corporate, and then you have a non-engineer in charge of Boeing commercial airplanes, uh, that's only happened once in the history of the company. That was between 2012 and 2016. Um, that's when the 737 MAX was developed. That's in other words, gee, it, there's no better way to create an environment where engineers don't have access to power, where they can't push back against expectations, resource expectations, time expectations, whatever else, other than to create a system where all the people on the top are not engineers and frank frankly, in many cases, feel a little bit intimidated by engineers. That's really damaging. So while I understand appointing her as an interim figure, I hope she's replaced by someone with a technical background or a manufacturing background or even an airplane strategy background, that would be fine too. And I would like to see someone similar at the top appointed to replace Dave Calhoun. I, I, when I was researching Boeing, I noticed that of the top nine executives, only two of them were engineers. And one of them was Stan Deal, who, who just left. So now, now it's only one. Well, that's why I said that a, a degree doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to do the job. But. So, so who should lead Boeing? Uh, you know, it's, it, it's a tough job to fill for the, for the simple reason that there aren't a lot of Boeings out there that you can poach people from. You don't put an, a one ad for this thing. Um, there have been a few names mentioned. I know the head of GE uh, Aerospace is one of them. I don't know uh, the person, but he looked, I mean, people speak, you know, he has the right background. And, and obviously a, a, a an engine is a very complex piece of machinery. 
and he has experience manufacturing them, that might be a place to look. Um, beyond that, my list gets very, very short. I, I just don't know. Richard? Yeah, I mean, got a list, checking it twice. Um, first of all, agree completely. The great thing about Larry Culp at, at GE is that he's been the first to say, old GE, a lot of bad ideas, let's transform it, and they've done that. It's taken him six, seven years, but reversing the emphasis on finance to an emphasis on people and technology and products has been his priority. I think he'd be a fantastic choice. Another great irony, and gee, that's ironic, right? But another great irony, of course, is, uh, you know, Boeing is about to acquire Spirit Aero Systems by all accounts, and Spirit is headed by Pat Shanahan, one of the legendary Boeing engineers. Boy, all they have to do is acquire, you know, some sort of reverse merger, I guess. They acquire Spirit Aero Systems and promote Pat. He'd be fantastic. And then there are plenty of other folks out there. Dave Gitlin is on the board. He's got a little explaining to do about his presence on the board. But boy, is he a great name in the industry. And he's done great work at Carrier. Um, you know, you've got Kathy Warden at Northrop Grumman, who's done fantastic work on the defense side of the industry. So there's no shortage of people. They just have to break that current addiction to getting someone with a purely finance background. So Javier DeLuis, Richard Abalafia, thanks so much for joining us today for this conversation.